Okay, let's make a start. Looks like we have a relatively relatively small group of us today. So it's gonna be, be quite a, a discussion oriented. Um, so first heads up of course is, oh, well, first of all, welcome to the May um, Nug Monthly Meeting. Uh, first heads up is we are recording the session. So the recording will be posted on the, the website um, kind of you know soon afterwards. Uh, along with the slides, so you know, if you prefer not to be recorded, please you know turn off video and so on. Uh, we also have a Slack channel going for sort of additional kind of chat and conversation. Um, we'll follow our normal agenda, which is uh, so win of the month today. I learned. Uh, we've got quite a bunch of announcements today. Um, and for topic of the day, we'll take a, a bit of a look at some of the, yeah, some of what we learned in the, the annual user survey this year. Um, and then uh, a look at what's coming up. So first up, uh, win of the month. So there's this opportunity to uh, show off an achievement or shout out something that uh, somebody else has achieved. And it can be yeah, big or small from accepting a paper, getting a paper accepted, solving a bug, um, something that would be a candidate for a science highlight or a uh, NERSC award. Um, yeah, does anybody like to kick us off? I see Stephen. Uh, shout out to the nurse team for getting the Perlmutter CPU nodes available to users. Um, so thank you. That's a that's a win. Thank you. Yes, I'll pass that on in the nurse internal Slack. In fact, I, I think you did. Uh, did you post something in the Nug Slack? I think I saw that, or somebody somebody mentioned it. So for so thank you for that. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of Not people. Not sure that been... was me, but yeah. <laughs> oh, some some somebody. I advertised it on the Desi Slack, but <laughs> ah. Um, yeah, so uh, a lot of people have been working kind of very hard to, you know, make this happen. And of course, there are still, you know, tweaks and so on going on. Um, I see Doug just joined, um, who's probably you know, particularly deserving of that shout out because he's uh, uh, led a lot of the effort. What well, I think you might have just missed, Doug, was uh, Stephen giving a, a shout out for getting Perlmutter's CPU nodes up and available to users. Oh, it's very kind. That's great. Yeah, it's been it's been very exciting. We've been trying to bring up the phase two of Perlmutter sort of very slowly and and with as I know it's been disruptive, but it, as little disruption as we possibly can, uh, so everybody can keep using it. So enjoy. It is very much appreciated. And thank you all also for um, you know banging on it, testing it out. Um, yeah, letting us know when when things need further tweaking and the, the issues and uh, improvements that you're finding. Anybody else got a uh, win they'd like to celebrate or that they know of? So I, I kind of have one that's halfway between a, a you know, a, a shout out of a win and a, and a today I learned. So I might use that as a segue onto our next slide, which is the other side of the coin today I learned, um, something that surprised you that can be, it you know, might be beneficial to others. Um, and, and this can range from something you got stuck on, something that you're still stuck on and, and would like input on, uh, through to something interesting that you watched or saw or, or stumbled across. And the kind of somewhere between some, something I learned and shared out here was that I was kind of fortunate enough to go to the, the Cray user group meeting a couple of weeks ago now, um, which uh, is uh, you know, attended by mostly uh, people who work at the sites who uh, have uh, Cray systems. And there was one particularly interesting um, presentation that I was in a, a session of. Um, uh, I 
think it was in fact a, a nurse user giving the presentation, although I think this particular work was done mostly on, on Summit instead. Uh, so she was describing work um, about using different uh, molecular dynamics, molecular simulation tools and how some of it applied to COVID research. But the, but the real today I learned that, I, that, that jumped out at me was, so we have nurse users use a whole range of different um, software, sometimes what appears to be the same thing to do. Uh, you know, people, people here might already be kind of very familiar with these and know the differences between, but for instance, uh, material science is a, a fairly big area. And we have people using uh, LAMPS and VASP and AMBER and NAMD and um, a few others, so yeah, uh, QE, uh, uh, was it Berkeley GW, et cetera, et cetera. And, and in one of the slides in this presentation, uh, the, the speaker put up kind of a few of these sort of from, you know, LAMPS through AMBER through, um, what was the one in between, through the VASP, and was describing about how, you know, why use these different uh, tools? You know, this tool does particularly well on very large, but more sort of coarse resolution or short um, time span simulations. This one does very well on the, the fine grain gas, right? Yeah, right down into the, um, you know, the, the, the quantum sort of level. But because of that, you can only simulate for, you know, small number of femtoseconds or picoseconds or something. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that I found that really interesting as, as somebody who kind of works alongside these things, but not directly with them, getting that better understanding of how the tools are used and the uh, benefits of each. So I'll, I'll drop names and, and shout out to uh, Ada Sadova who presented that. Anybody else got a something they learned that, or something they're stuck on they'd like to talk about? So while people are thinking about it, actually there's one more sort of shout out for an achievement that I'd like to make, which is, oops, kind of back a slide. But also forward a slide. Uh, I see Koichi is online and uh, he set up some structure and kind of some people to start a kind of a like a, a special interest group, a, a, a subgroup within NUG of people interested in or people who use WARF. And uh, I think that was uh, a really good move and we're seeing some sort of interest. So it's like to, yeah. Thanks, Koichi, and, and give a shout out for that. Oh yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Thanks, thank you, Stephen, uh, to mention that. So yeah, from our discussion at uh, Nagex, we uh, sort of launching a pilot, uh, special interest group among NASC users, and from climate science community, we choose one particular uh, very common application. It's called Wolf, uh, weather research and forecast model. It's been there for more than 10 years and many people are still using it. Like top 18 code at NASC a few years ago uh, uh, survey. And, uh, but we, I do hear uh, people struggling sometimes to, for example, compile and run after some maintenance or OS update. And then also we do this, not every user are aware of best practices and then to improve workflow. And this model is quite flexible. So some, you know, some of us want to share those knowledge. And then we do have a large uh, file size of input data, for example, global one kilometer topography data that right now individual users are downloading to their own scratch space or project space. So we are talking to share those information in files and further uh, facilitate collaboration among NASC users from different projects. So we sent out invitations to a few uh, mailing lists uh, across the DOE uh, programs. And we already got about 20 people signed up. And then we got also inquiries 
from outside the NASC asking, hey, is this just a unique to NASC user? This is, sounds like a great idea. And then also, uh, I heard another uh, software engineer maintaining a computer server for the observation data set that the uh, NASC DOE's uh, ARM uh, program are uh, sort of keen to what's happening in this group. So they're getting nice uh, momentum. So probably, uh, we're going to launch the first virtual meeting to ask for more feedback. What would be really good uh, way to uh, communicate among users and take advantage of uh, NASC facilities? And then we're going to report back maybe in the next or next next uh, uh, monthly meeting. Thank you. Sounds good. Yeah, thanks for getting that underway, Koji. Sure. Yeah. Be good to see sort of the yeah, the outcomes of yeah, there's a, a a whole lot of uh, users who know you know to different degrees different details of this and yeah getting building up a, a support community there I think could be a really good thing. Do we have, uh, before we move on, any other lessons or tips or interesting insights? Uh, can I ask just one quick question? Sure. I'm stuck for two months now for this particular program to uh, compile a sort of legacy climate model CSM 1.5 working with Helen. The model suddenly uh, complains of a reallocation error uh, in, in the memory model, memory space. And this uh -huh. happens when we change the compiler, I thought from version 18 or older to 19 or newer. With 19 or newer, uh, we got this uh, error, no matter what we do. Um, usual solution is to use uh, the memory, MC model, medium or large, which at NASC, we, I think we have to make uh, build the model or code as a shared library or dynamically linked executable. Yep. That's not really helping us. And then Helena and I are pretty confused. This model stubbornly try to make uh, statically linked uh, libraries of its own. But I'm just curious if anybody knows what changed between version 18 and version 19 of I thought. From Wikipedia, version 19 start to include some Fortran 2018 features. And that's the only one I can see. Uh, version 18, they cover full Fortran 2008 support, but uh, that's, I, I really don't have not much idea, but just, just in case if anybody knows really there's any huge change between version nine, from version 19 of iPhone. That's a good question. Has anybody, uh, I guess, come across other issues moving from 18 to 19? It is entirely possible that it's a new bug in version 19. Uh, I guess it's also possible that it's a, a fixed bug in version 19 or, or, or you know, not, not, not so much a bug, but something that changed is exposing something. Uh, in the newer version, yeah. Actually, I haven't yeah. tried even newer ones. So yeah, and this project, project bug or problem is not just unique to NASC environment. I heard similar uh, happening at the computer system at NCA, National Center for Atmospheric Researches. So, right. so it's more unique to somewhat I thought or any Intel environment. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I might just give a try to the latest version available right now on Mask and see what's happened. So I think it is still possible to. Uh, to use version 18 uh, on not Corey? Uh, not, uh, I don't think so. It retired uh, at the March update. Yeah, uh, I think there is still a way to get it. So we can we can kind of uh, yeah, talk, talk about that offline as to, oh, to okay. how to do it. Um, 
So that might be one kind of workaround. Another thing that might be worth a try that I've found is um, uh, a linear forge, arm forge rather. Um, the DDT tool has a memory, um, also oh. for a memory debugging option. And I found that can actually be pretty helpful for if it if it genuinely is bugging the code as opposed to something the compiler is doing wrong. Right, um, I try. That can be pretty good for finding it. I try use a DDT or power. Hmm, I forgot. Uh, didn't even start actually. I got some different errors, but I'm gonna give it a try one more time. Yeah, because I've changed some settings. So yeah, okay, yeah. Thanks for the advice. No worries. And if there's not one already, it might be worth opening up a ticket to you know, bounce more ideas around between between NERSC support. Yeah. So some interesting, interesting challenges to solve there. Um, Next up, unless somebody else has uh, something they want to add very briefly, we have uh, quite a bunch of announcements and news at the moment. So there's quite a few in the latest weekly email. Hopefully you've uh, seen that or at least can find it uh, buried in your inbox easily enough. Um, and I think the, you know, the big exciting one that was uh, already alluded to is that all NERSC users now have access to Perlmutter. Um, and Palmata has CPU nodes up as well. Um, one kind of important change that is worth knowing about is before the CPU, but yeah, phase two CPU only nodes were integrated, the default program was program NVIDIA, um, yeah, because it was uh, very much oriented towards building and running for GPUs. Uh, however, now Palmata is both a GPU and a CPU machine. So to sort of reflect that there are you know, different ways of using it, the default is now program GNU when you log in. And whether you prefer to use program GNU, program NVIDIA, or uh, I think it's uh, still sort of you know, in the process of being built out and tested. Uh, some of the others, such as the, you know, there's a, a AOCC compiler available, uh, the Cray compiler as well. Um, yeah, I guess the important thing is that uh, now you do need to remember to change across to the program that you want. If it's uh, if uh, GNU either yeah, isn't ideal for your situation, yeah, for your for your particular code. That, that said, uh, GNU quite often does a, a, you know, a pretty good job on most things. Um, the other element of Perlmutter news that's it's more kind of, uh, uh, I guess, one level deeper, but yeah, I, I think it's, it's interesting news is the CPU nodes are set up with a, a newer version of the interconnect. Uh, you probably, you, you might've seen the, the, the name Slingshot 10 and Slingshot 11 uh, bouncing around. So that's, that's the difference. The CPU nodes are on a, a newer interconnect and we're still tweaking the settings. So yeah, as you, as you run things, uh, yeah, we're, we're interested in hearing uh, your experiences and yeah, particularly around performance and so on. Um, Doug, while we're on a Perlmutter topic, is there anything else you'd like to tell people about? Um, I can give a little, little bit of a, you know, sort of a sneak peek of where things will be going, you know, over the next few weeks. Uh, clearly, you know, there is no real timeline that we can we can commit to, and that's just because um, we're 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 yeah, because you know we're 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 relying on things sort of getting done as they as as, as soon as they can. Um, but just sort of in general, the expectation, you know, so we have at the end of this experience, we're going to have three thousand seventy two CPU nodes. You'll notice at present we only have seven hundred and sixty eight, and not all of those are fully functional yet, but most of them are. The great, great majority of them are. Uh, you'll see the next group of 768 get integrated probably in the first week of June. Uh, that is a reasonably, reasonably firm timeline. Um, you can also expect, and we're also doing a lot of other 
network related work and we're, we're getting tons of updates and feedback and collaboration from HPE. Um, and so as a consequence, we're likely going to have um, weekly um, uh, maintenances on Perlmutter uh, of one kind or another uh, in order to make sure that we're getting, getting sort of these corrections and updates out as fast as we can. Um, because we have to sort of keep our test systems, which are very, very advanced of where we're at, uh, sort of settled and, 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 and functional. Um, where things will get really interesting, and we have sort of mentioned this already, there's been a lot of curiosity around it, but I'm happy to speak to it a little bit, is going to be as we move the GPU nodes from Slingshot 10 to Slingshot 11. Um, so certainly we can't guarantee that everything is going to you know, the, the, everything in the Mellanox software stack is going to continue to work as it has. Um, that's not been the point. Um, what we will be doing is we're working on building a fairly significantly sized uh, test resource right now um, in which to, uh, it'll have at the end 256 GPU nodes um, on our Alvarez test system. And to that end, we're going to be working with HPE to get sort of all of our critical software um, in codes that we use to validate the system working as well as possible before we start remanufacturing and rebuilding the rest of the, the system and bringing that forward uh, for the users. So, you know, what I'm trying to say is that change is coming, um, but we're doing what we can to, uh, to make sure that what we deploy when you see it will be reasonably mature and quite, quite useful. Thanks, Doug. Happy to answer questions about it. Yeah, so uh, interesting times coming up and lots of uh, kind of yeah, progress and opportunities. And I guess, uh, yeah, it's, it's good to see people on there and running things. And I suppose, yeah, it heads up that there might be occasional uh, uh, disruptions and you know, things being tweaked and so on. Um, it's, Probably also worth um, sort of noting and remember that Perlman is not a production resource yet. And you know, on the one hand, that means that you know, things will change reasonably uh, rapidly. Uh, on the other is that um, usage isn't being charged on it yet. Uh, Stephen? Yeah, I really appreciate that the um, Perlman system has the debug and interactive cues from the beginning. That's really useful for kicking the tires on it. Um, I was wondering whether you're planning on eventually having a shared queue on Perlmutter as well. Um, you know, if you need to access just one GPU, not all four, or just a subset of the cores on a CPU node. Is that planned for the future? Do you want to answer this, Doug, or shall I? I'm, I'm happy to. Okay. I'm happy to. So. Actually, that has been one of our key plans all along. It's something that we really would have liked to have delivered earlier. Um, we, we found some uh, pretty significant technical issues that I don't really want to address um, uh, what they were, but it's prevented us from enabling that functionality. Um, what I can provide is that the, the very initial software uh, from our various vendors that will enable that functionality will come to us in, in basically late summer. Um, and obviously, uh, if you've seen my style, you know that we, we keep our systems pretty up to date. So you know that we'll, we'll, we'll deliver that functionality as early as we possibly can. Um, but the earliest that you might see that would be in late summer. That's good to know that it's in the works. You know, from the end user side, it's not that big a deal while the, you know, we're not getting charged for them anyway, but I anticipate in the future, there will be times when I only need a fraction of a node. So it'd be good to have that option in the queue. Thanks. Yeah, it would be uh, good once we are able to enable that. So I think basically the, uh, yeah, current news on Perlmutter. Uh, we have a, a bunch of other announcements about other things too. Uh, one is you might have seen in the weekly email, uh, there's a, a survey out at the moment for nurse users of uh, machine learning. Yeah, that 
you know, machine learning AI type stack of tools. Uh, we're kind of looking to you know, uh, work out what's the best way to you know, arrange your know, optimized design um, Perlmutter and future systems for ML capabilities and performance. We, we're getting a, and actually we'll, we'll see this pretty shortly in there. Um, you know, when, we're, when we're talking about user survey results, we're seeing a, a, a distinct increase in interest and usage of ML related approaches. So yeah, uh, planning for that is, is kind of important. Um, some various calls for participation. These all have uh, more details and links in the weekly email. Uh, it's probably easier to look there than uh, paste a great deal of uh, information here. Um, summer internships are starting soon. So if you have or are a student who's interested in doing an internship at Nurse, uh, I think there's still time to uh, apply and get into that. Um, the CM conference is coming up. I have gotten the dates, but um, there's a, a broader engagement program as part of it. And it's uh, looking for participants at the moment. Uh, we also just recently announced, and this is uh, organized in part by uh, Zenji and some people at NERSC as well as others, um, the third international symposium on checkpointing for supercomputing. So that has a, a CFP out at the moment too. A whole bunch of training events coming up. Um, or a mixture of training events and webinars. So in, uh, was it next week? The ECP webinar series has a webinar on how to be a great mentor. There's, there's some great webinars in this series, so it's worth a look. Um, Argon ALCF has a computational performance workshop coming up next week. There is a training on the LLVM and OpenMP ecosystem also next week, so links to how to register for that uh, are in the weekly email. Uh, a couple of, um, I guess, uh, semi-regular nurse trainings that are also coming up soon in June is we have an introduction to nurse resources and also a crash course in supercomputing. If I remember rightly, the crash course in supercomputing was uh, initially set up to help um, uh, new interns get on board and new students had to yeah, come up to speed quickly. So yeah, particularly if you're working with students over the summer, that might be a, a good option for them. Uh, and then also in June, the next uh, Ideas ECP webinar uh, is on uh, normalizing inclusion by embracing difference. That's uh, almost a month from now. So that's the ones that uh, I knew about and gathered up. Are there any others that people in the room here would like to announce uh, CFPs for things that you're uh, involved in or, or know of, other events coming up. If not, we can go on to our um, topic of the day, which is the NERSC annual user survey. So, Every, uh, every year, usually around I think, uh, October or November, you probably start seeing emails from NERSC or from, in more recent years, uh, a group called MBRI asking you to participate in a annual user survey. And uh, we, yeah, we only do it once a year, we try to minimize the amount of uh, uh, load, but uh, it also gathers really valuable information for NERSC. So a little bit of an overview of, of what it is and why we do it and, you know, and what we're learning. So we've been surveying most users each year since at least 1998. And in fact, I think earlier than that, but uh, 1998 was when we moved to um, LBL. And uh, I guess <laughs> web pages changed. Um, there's been a few changes over the years. You go back several years and the survey was very long. Um, and a couple of times now, I think it's been made a little bit shorter and simpler. Um, so it's sort of about you know, 20 questions plus some free fourth questions now. And in the last two or three years, uh, we've actually had the survey run by a group called MBRI, which is a, um, a what do you call it, a, a dedicated um, survey organization. Um, 
uh, a move that came with this so on their on their recommendation about current best practices for surveys was most questions we did have a seven point scale which meant that there was there was an answer in the middle for neutral and uh, the current best practices are actually to use a six point scale and you know, encourage um, participants in the survey to yeah, to choose whether they, they fall on the on the plus on the negative side. So from you know, from year to year, this is sort of not a terribly um, obvious difference. It uh, gives us some interesting challenges when we're comparing year to year, though when things change. Um, so the survey consists at the moment, you know, in the in the most recent survey, we had eighteen you know ranking type questions where we ask people to to comment about whether. Uh, to, to select where on a scale from very dissatisfied to very satisfied they are on uh, a number of aspects of nurse uh, services and, and resources. And then there's three free form sort of questions, uh, which are really there to, to try to cover the bits that weren't covered in the ranking questions um, and to, you know, to give survey respondents sort of an opportunity to you know, to talk about things that either they really like or they really don't like that, you know, might not have hit our radar yet. And one of them, of course, is uh, other other comments, which yeah, which which is really a, a catch all. So, you know, is there is there anything we missed in the questions so far? And um, this most recent year, we also added a new category question, which is how do you primarily use nurse services? And so sort of look at that outcomes of that and, and why that was interesting sort of shortly. So there's, there's kind of a couple of reasons for the survey. Really the two, the two primary things that we're looking for when we run the survey is um, you know, we as NERSC kind of you know, care about the, the services we're providing and the resources we're providing to our users. We want to make sure that we're you know, heading in the right direction, uh, detect things that are on users' minds and that um, yeah, areas to improve and areas to keep on uh, you're know, doing what we're doing. So, so you know, so one important aspect is for nurse to help uh, to help nurse identify our user needs. Uh, and the other aspect is it's part of our reporting to uh, the Department of Energy. So each year, nurse produces a annual report. And what I should have done was put a, a link into this. You can actually find this on the on the nurse web pages. Um, I think it's under uh, www.nursc4users. We have final link to it soon. Um, but the yeah, the annual reports each year are, are published, and um, the the user survey is not you know not by a long way the only thing that's part of the annual report, but it does inform uh, you know, a fairly large and important section of it. So. Who fills it out? This is this is always kind of an interesting challenge because you know nurse, we actually have quite a lot of users. So in in twenty twenty one we sent the survey out to eight thousand seven hundred and seventy six nurse users, um, and you know we we have to sort of make some calls on what counts as an active user because you know, when you're when you're going on a, on a year by year and your know, allocations that happen year by year, yeah, there are there are some users who you know might you know, be on NERSC's books, so to speak, at the beginning of the year because they're winding up from a, a previous project but aren't during the year. There are other users who come on during the year, who you know, might join a project in October, and they're, they're still a NERSC user. Um, so uh, Iris is quite helpful for you know, helping, helping us to find which were the uh, active users in the last year and, and getting an up-to-date list that we can uh, survey. And, we want to get a pretty good representative sample, um, both in terms of you know, a wide range across users, and also in terms of um, you know, there are there are some users who are sort of you know power users and um, they use quite a lot of nurse hours, and in a way, you know the the projects that use the use nurse the most heavily are the ones that are most impacted by things. So we look to, you know, we, we generally try to get responses from 10% of nurse users overall. And for the responses to sort of 
represent between them 50% of NERSC hours. And you can see um, this year we didn't quite hit 50%. Um, part of that, I think there's a, part of it I think is because um, the, the, the distribution of users is a little flatter this year. Um, we did manage to hit 10% of users, which is good. Uh, so one of the things we were, we were seeing was that it was getting increasingly difficult to sort of, you know, drum up um, participation and getting MBRI, MBRI on board kind of helped a bit with that. Um, yeah, from both from a survey best practices, yeah, make the survey more um, tractable and yeah, easy for, for users to fill out and also um, yeah, encouraging uh, people to fill the survey out and you know, gathering the results and, um, and doing analysis on it. So you can see we've, um, this is the uh, just you know, fraction of users and it, the actual number of users increases year to year because you know, we're getting an increasing number of people using those resources, um, which means that the, the number of responses we're looking for is increasing gradually as well. Um, but you know, we've, we've generally managed to sort of keep it around the 10% below it a couple of times and just sitting above. So this new question that I uh, talked about and you know, we talked a little bit about you know, machine learning and uh, you know, data analysis type things. Um, you go back a few years and I suspect what you would find is if you looked at the nurse user community, uh, it would be almost entirely people who run simulations, especially kind of, you know, fairly, fairly traditional type of simulations. Um, in, yeah, as, as sort of time goes on, uh, the way that science happened uh, is expanding. We're getting a lot more science happening through data analysis as well. And we're also sort of seeing that kind of, you know, a, a wider, um, you know, variety, I guess, of, of science domains within the offices. So we're interested, you know, how many, how many of our users are using nurse resources, I guess, in a more traditional way compared to uh, newer uh, use cases that are more data oriented and other things as well. So, so we ask the question of you know, how, how do you primarily use it? And, and we'll see, you know, primarily, so, so you only get to pick one because I, I know a lot of people actually could, could quite validly say, all of the above on this. Um, so what we found was that uh, more than half are running simulations, but only a little more than half. Um, nearly a quarter are primarily using nurse resources to analyze data. So, so the use of data and data analysis mechanisms is you know, increasingly important. Uh, we also have a, a fairly large chunk, so about uh, almost 15% who are actually developing or supporting um, software as their main kind of you know, role at NERSC. So my interpretation of this is you know, most projects have got, you know, they, they either use some software, a lot of projects are you know, developing, you know, developing their own software essentially and running simulations. Um, and those projects are, you have, have people doing different roles. So, so we have some people who are developing the software and supporting the software, some people who are using the software for, you know, for the actual domain science in question. Uh, just out of curiosity and a, and a show of hands, um, are the people here in, in terms of, um, yeah, in terms of, I guess, uh, developing software versus doing the domain science with the software. Uh, what's the what does the split look like? If you're uh, mostly mostly developing software, want to raise a hand? Oh, I've lost track of where they're. Okay, so I see three who are more on the software side. So yeah, so the the split here is probably pretty similar. Then it's uh, kind of in the order of fifteen percent. Uh, people here. 
Um, we also have a number of users who, who are you know, mostly on for the sake of managing their team. Um, and, and some other, and I didn't sort of uh, drill down for, for today into what the other was. So I think it will be interesting watching over the next few years um, how this chart changes, whether we see, you know, is, it, is it fairly stable? Are we going to see you know, an increase in one area or another? Um, so what else did we learn from it? So the good news from nurse point of view is that overall um, nurse users, at least the ones who respond to the survey, uh, are rating nurse quite highly, which, which is encouraging. It means that uh, we must be doing uh, something right here. Um, so there are sort of two groups of questions. We have some sort of uh, your large scale overall type categories, as well as you know, a bunch more detailed questions. And so the, the, the two bars here are comparing this year and last, or get, get the most recent with the, the previous one. And we have a target which is set in the, I think it's kind of in the, in the you know, three quarters the way up in terms of sort of average scores. Um, and it's nice to see that our um, uh, ratings are consistently above, tar above target. And when you get down to the individual questions, there's a little more variation, but they're still all um, you know, well above target. Something that I didn't manage to do for this um, presentation was a sample of some of you know, what, what the actual breakdown on a per question looks like, but uh, it is quite skewed. We see that the vast majority in the, um, the, the, the very satisfied with a few in the moderately satisfied, but then with a, you know, a longer tail of um, people uh, reporting less satisfaction. Um, so it's, it's very much not a Gaussian distribution. Um, and if we look historically, so the, the key here is a little bit too small to read, but this goes back to 1998. Um, and it's, it's kind of a, a little bit of a sample of one in the, the first question asks just overall um, for participants, uh, overall satisfaction with nurse services and resources. And uh, yeah, there's been consistently kind of, you know, fairly high and well above target for nurse history. Where we start to get some uh, additional interesting um, outcomes is in the in the freeform questions because this can help to you know, pop out things that we might not have asked in the ranking questions that are that are key things. And so there are, there are really two freeform questions that are the, the the key here. The the third one about other comments tends to sort of have a mixture of both of these for the most part. So one of the things that I'll survey. Uh, company did for us was they produced a, a word cloud of um, responses to these questions. So we can see kind of a few themes coming out here, which is that uh, support, documentation, resources are um, you're popular in, the, uh, in, in terms of what NERSC does well. Things that users report that they would uh, like more of. See a bit about the uh, time, queue, jobs. Um, Corey is an interesting one. I guess uh, Corey being the primary resource means that um, that's where people's uh, experience hits. Resources. Um, I think a, a theme that jumps out here is uh, <laughs> queue time and getting jobs through and the, the and amount of resources. Which is worth sort of digging into a little bit more. And this is another advantage of having a dedicated survey company do some of this is that, yeah, they can, they can do some, uh, what do you call it? Statistical analysis that, you know, might not be beyond nurse to do, but it's certainly quite, uh, you know, it's a, it's a different specialization and would take quite a lot of uh, effort. And so, you know, we're able to get a good um, analysis by 
basically pulling into experts. So one of the things that um, they do is they look at what themes in the freeform answers correlated, uh, in fact, I think both in the freeform and in the rank ranking answers, correlated to differences in the overall scores and sort of your top, top level scores and found there was, there were several, but kind of, you know, probably four top ones that jumped out. So, so one was computational resources and uh, everybody wants more, of course, but people are generally positive about it. And we found that, well, they, they, it was found that uh, comments about computational resources generally correlated with um, higher overall satisfaction. Uh, technical support also is uh, generally quite well rated. That was, uh, that was good to see. Documentation was an interesting one because it wasn't actually really strongly correlated with either. And there was both uh, sort of negatives and positives. Um, the uh, interpretation I think here is that uh, generally NERSC's documentation is considered to be quite thorough and uh, high quality, um, but there are areas that we could still improve it. There are areas that people would like more documentation uh, and sometimes navigating it isn't straightforward. So that's kind of an interesting area for, uh, from, from this perspective, something for us to look at, you know, how can we tweak it further and, and how can we sort of you know, do more with what we've got here? I think we're sort of, you know, we're heading in a, we're heading in a good direction and it's, uh, there's the, the certainly more that we can do. Uh, and the other interesting one was uh, Q time. So Q time got a lot of comments around uh, in, in terms of things that people would like to see improved. So, so you know, people feel the pain of long Q weights, uh, but it was actually only very weakly correlated with um, having a, a lower overall satisfaction. I think the interpretation for this is that uh, Q time definitely is a pain point, but our users also understand that this is, this is fundamentally a, a resource constraint and that um, you know, we have a, a quite a large resource, but it's also still a finite resource and there's quite a lot of demand on it. Um, it is actually an area that is of a you know, very high interest to NERSC as well. And, and one of the things that we you know, fairly, fairly uh, you know, frequently, constantly working on is ways to improve, especially the utilization. Um, the, the less time that compute nodes are sitting idle, the more time that they're actually you know, working on people's jobs and getting them out of their, their queues. And so doing things to sort of tweak the queues to, to fill in those gaps and to you know, most, most efficiently pack the machine is a, is a, a perennial interest. So I got to the end of that one rather, rather suddenly. So that, that's kind of the high level overview of um, the survey and, and the things that we found um, in the, the survey for 2021. So the most, most recent one that happened over the, over the winter. Um, but we've got a, a little bit of time for discussion. Um, do people have any questions about that or how, how do you feel that sort of corresponds with, uh, I guess, your uh, lived experience? And silence, too much, <laughs> too much detail all at once. Oh, for us, uh... yeah, complex questions, which is, which is all good. Uh, hopefully at least it's an interesting overview of um, yeah, nurse perspective on yeah, finding out how things are going and, and where to focus next. 
so our normal last sort of couple of items are a quick look at um, last month's numbers, some metrics, and, uh, and what's coming up. Uh, last month, for uh, uh, those of you who uh, joined us, we had an interesting sort of discussion about what metrics are interesting. And um, so I think the, the, what do you call it, the, the key outcome of that, that, that I took from that was that the post hoc metrics are kind of interesting, but what's much more interesting is a way to easily find out what's the state of the machine now, and not just in this sort of a black and white, is it up and down, up or down, but yeah, how is it performing? How's the file system performing? So on like that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, building out the capability for that is going to take a little longer. It's, uh, it's, it's going to be a slightly longer project. Um, but it was good to discover those things, and, and you know, we are sort of looking into you know, how can we how can we do something like this. Um, so for the moment, we just got a, a simplified version, really. Uh, just a, a highlight of what were the, the scheduled and unscheduled outages. And we did on Corey have a couple of unscheduled outages last month. Um, one was a, a slim issue. This was an interesting one because it was, uh, it turns out with a, a large enough command line, um, oh, I guess it still does count as a, a bug in slow because it didn't handle the, the super long command line ele elegantly, but uh, it uh, caused it to jam up you know, to, to fix that. Uh, and the other was a hardware issue. I don't actually recall the details of it. Uh, Quote might have had three outages. Um, two of them were maintenances. And uh, I haven't actually located what was the, the detailed cause of there was a, an outage immediately following one of the maintenances. I suspect it might have been a case of just something didn't quite come up cleanly. Um, Topics coming up, so we have a, a few things kind of in the pipeline that we're looking at um, for, for NAG monthly meeting topics. Uh, one is HPSS interfaces, and another is uh, data citation and DOIs. These have been uh, mentioned by people as topics of interest. We're very interested to hear what else people are interested in hearing about, and better still, what else are people interested in speaking about? This is kind of a, this, um, topic of the day slot is uh, kind of a, a good opportunity to show off uh, work that you're doing. Um, if you have a topic that you'd like to nominate or better still present, um, we have a Google form here at this address. I'll paste it into the chat. Oops. Click there and, and fill in some details. We're very interested to hear and yeah, we're very interested also, uh, and especially in hearing about the work that our users are doing. And so that's all we have on the agenda for today. Um, we've actually uh, gotten in before the, before the top of the hour. Thank you all for joining us. Um, Steve, can I yeah. ask a quick question? Certainly. Yes, so, <clears throat> so my research group is going to uh, make a big test, probably use 1,000 to 2,000 cores. Uh, so the KNL is always available for this kind of a larger job. Yeah. And we don't need to submit a special request to the nurse Gustavo. No. Um, okay. In fact, for, for large jobs, so we have, um, what's the number? Uh, uh, we have somewhere in the order of 10,000 KNL nodes on Corey. Okay, so usually um, even 10,000 should be available. Uh, pretty close to that. So there's a, a few that are set aside for like certain, certain queues and so on. Um, uh, we do have a docs page on it. It's it's a quite large number. You know, more than I've forgotten what the number is, but I'm pretty sure it's it's well more than eight thousand nodes um, before you start to need a, a reservation um, mm -hmm. for um, 
yeah, for, for a couple of thousand nodes. In fact, if you're using more than 1,000 nodes, uh, you get a large job discount. So the, but they usually, the, uh, so right now the queue, the time that my student told me usually two or three days in the queue, then the job just go to run, to be run. But the even larger, let's see, well, this is roughly, I my rough calculation is roughly uh, 1,280, uh, uh, okay. That is some, you know, 1,280, that is a totally core, you know. The, the total so, cores? Yeah, it's just the core, it's a CPU, uh, a regular CPU. So yeah. this, this, this is just a regular, job if we submit let's say we wait for two days there's no guarantee the job is going to run to be run right so the the big thing here is actually going to be how long the wall time is so okay so this is still a 48 hour right so a 48 hour wall time job almost no matter how many nodes even at a single node is going to uh -huh. wait quite a long time in the queue potentially a few weeks uh -huh. um if you can so arrange the hourly the, charge uh, is going to be very high, right? Oh, the hourly charge isn't for time in the queue, though. The hourly charge only starts when mm -hmm. the job starts. But there's no discount, you know, for the much very large job. Uh, so for jobs over 1,024 nodes, there is a discount of, I think it's 25%. It's, okay. Um, we, have a, we have a docs page. Okay. All right, let's see if I can. Okay. Um, jobs, queues, and charges. So for Corey, yeah, and panel, for instance, here we go. So max nodes, you can go up to the full system, and there's a note here that. KNL? Yeah. Okay, some... KNL is a big job, it's a 0.5 discount. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So for for a large job on KNL, that's when you're using over a thousand nodes. So so a thousand and twenty four nodes of KNL gets you um, around uh, close to seventy thousand cores, I think, because there's sixty eight cores per node. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so that is quite a big job, um, even. Even for a fairly large job, I think I think we found that up to about like a quarter of the machine, so a couple of thousand nodes. If you can get the wall time down to chunks of sort of four hours or less, it'll probably get in pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, when you start getting wall times, longer wall times, yeah, they, they kind of correlate with Q wait times and 48 hour wall times pretty pretty much wait, you pretty much wait until everything in front of them has run. So if you can if you can do things like checkpointing to break the job into shorter chunks, okay. or if the job can scale higher and use you know, twice as many cores for half as much time, you'll probably get through the queue faster. Okay, thank you, Steve. No worries. I got a small question. Uh, when running on Perlmutter, um, say I want to run a couple probing uh, jobs like uh, LSCPU, NVIDIA SMI, will those be rounded up to the nearest unit or uh, how does it work? Does Slurm account for like fractional usage? Um, do you mean as in your uh, S batch or S allocating a node, but just running LSCPU on it? Yes. So Sloan doesn't actually, so for, for charging purposes, Sloan doesn't look so much at what you're running as just how many nodes for how long you are occupying. So if you have a node, like if you, you know, if you as Alec has batched a node for 10 minutes, then that's a node for 10 minutes. So it's, you know, one, one sixth of a nurse hour. Okay, so for charging purposes, they do take fractional charges, not rounded up. Fractional of the hour, but not of the nodes. It will still be the full node. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. <laughs>